The Mandate of Heaven. It is one of those things that anyone who even remotely read anything related to China has heard of. Many also seem to kind of have an idea of what it is. The mandate given by heaven to the righteous ruler of China or the kingdoms within. When their leadership is good, the heaven is on their side. But when their kingdom declines, their rule becomes obsolete. Thus the mandate can go to someone else. The mandate can be taken away or geming and transferred to a ruler more suitable to fulfill the degrees of heaven. The will of the heavens are often read within the heavens themselves, and when one takes a closer look at the mandate, it becomes quite clear that the celestial theater was the biggest influence on the communication of the mandate. Through the heavens, rulers were not only chosen, but also put in charge to deliver the will of the heavens to the people they ruled over. Alongside the heavenly mandate, goes a many thousand years old interest into the skies. Though many often point towards the Zhou dynasty and the book of documents or the Shangshu as the origin of the tradition, our story of the mandate starts several thousand years before the first king of Zhou claimed his rightful place in the cosmos. Our brief journey to the roots of the mandate starts off at the Yellow River around 3 to 5000 BC the Neolithic Yangshao culture was already fairly occupied with the sky above. At today's archaeological site, at the Great River Village or Da He Zun, the people of the past admired their heavenly companions and painted them on their beautiful ceramic pots and decorated bowls. They honored the heavens and their deceased by arranging their graves in accordance with the celestial directions. A feeling of spirituality and religiosity looms within those places. And maybe, just maybe, the first map of the stars. Before the great Shang kings and their oracle bones came along, the rulers, probably with the help of wise shamans, were expected to guide the land in accordance with the signs read in the sky. The connections between the heavenly rhythms and the fate of the people on earth became an essential experience of every person in the kingdom. But how would the next ruler, or rather the next ten rulers, know the rhythms of the heavens? The Great Chang answers this question. Astronomical phenomena, heaven's unspoken messages, needed to be kept on record. Though there are no older records than the famous Shang Dynasty oracle bones, it is almost certain that the documentation of the stars is much older than any leftover evidence can ever tell us. But the oracle bones is what we have. And what fantastic stories they tell us. Stories of the Lord above, the Shang Di, in the middle of all and holding command over the world, and his five ministers, Venus, Mars, Mercury, Saturn and Jupiter the five objects which moved so different across the sky than all the tightly bound star formations. What might their movement tell us about our lives down here? When all five gather in one house, the heavens must decree something truly magnificent. Later Confucianism would take the Shangdi and extend his touch. Not only was he the center of it all, but the ruler would become the point around which all resolved radiating outwards in his quest to serve the will of the heavens. Of course, what the Shang wrote down as the degree bringer heaven, the Tian, is hard to define. Throughout history, many have offered an image. Is it an indescribable above, an actual entity, or is it just an abstract after all? Many possibilities, and probably all, can be found at some point in time. While the Shang Dynasty's king's role as the head among the shamans may have continued as a tradition inherited by their ancestors, the institutional apparatus established to read the will of heaven may have slowly pushed the shamans out of the communication business. 
The Zhou dynasty, as many dynasties and cultures before and after, adopted some of the cultural aspects and modified them for their own purposes. Here, during this long space of time, we find vast documents about the order of all things. Here it is, where the term Tian Ming was coined and certainly further written into state and social doctrine. For example, the Shangshu explores the fall of King Jie of Xia by the hands of the mystical King Tang of Shang as follows. The king said, Come, ye multitudes of the people, listen all to my words. It is not I, the little child, who dare to undertake a rebellious enterprise, but for the many crimes of the sovereign of Xia, heaven has given the charge to destroy him. There is evidence, however, that the Tianming concept predates the Zhou dynasty, as the Shangshu reveals to its reader, you know, the earlier men of Yin had documents and records of how Yin superseded the mandate of Xia. During the Zhou, the state apparatus grew immensely, and to understand the order of things, the knowledge of the heavens was broadened and nurtured. With every passing century, the mysterious movement of the heavenly bodies was extensively studied, and predictions were made, predictions that if proven wrong, became the carriers of messages, warnings of events to come. Worthiness, responsibility and fulfillment of celestial will were expressed through essential rituals optimized and carefully created in accordance with the heavenly demands. Mistakes will bring calamity, major signs of heaven, marking great changes ahead. The Zhou believed that the fall of Shang was not a coincidence. A mere 13 years before its demise, the King Wen saw the five planets move closer together gathering just west of the great vermilion bird in the southern sky. He knew his time had come. Heaven called to him and his descendants to overthrow the Shang, and fall it would, not under King Wen, but under his son, the notorious father of the Zhou and destroyer of Shang, King Wu of Zhou. As King Wu tells it through the writings in the Book of Documents, but it was the King Tai who laid the foundation of the royal inheritance. The King Ji was diligent for the royal house, and my deceased father, King Wen, completed his merit and grandly received the appointment of heaven to soothe the region of our great land. The great states feared his strength. The small states thought fondly of his virtue. In nine years, however, the whole kingdom was not united under his rule and it fell to me, the little child, to carry out his will. Thus, it was not a massacre, but an act of moral responsibility. To deny the will of heavens would be to deny the order of things and end in chaos. Of course, the five ministers and the dynastic transitions were not the only messages sent from heaven. For example, the wise men of Cho were reading the position of Jupiter to receive knowledge about the outcome of battles. The Cho's rights, perceptions, and established world order reaches far deeper into the Chinese culture than any society before. From dynasties to come to newfound religious ideas, hardly anyone was able to completely avoid the will of the heavens. So we see Confucius proclaiming in his famous Analects, there are three things of which the superior man stands in awe. He stands in awe of the ordinance of heaven. He stands in awe of great men. He stands in awe of the words of sages. The great mortal, founder of Moism, would not dare to deny the degrees of heaven either. And after being asked about his condemnation of violence by the lords of the warring states, but not when it comes to the dynastic transitions, mortal said, you have not examined the terminology of my teaching and you do not understand its motive. What they did is not to be called attack, but punishment. The rulers of Han, proud of their mandate taken from the Qin and given to them, developed the importance of the investigation of the celestial matters. Astronomy and calendrics became even more sophisticated. As strong and as institutionalized it was, it is quite foolish to assume the mandate was all. Because let's not forget, as one researcher put it, if the empire was prosperous, strong and at peace, no pretender, however well placed, 
was likely to challenge the legitimacy of the dynastic mandate simply on the basis of what transpired in the sky. During the Han, the first great historical recordings are written. The genius astronomer and historian Sima Jian fills his first chapter already with images of divine rulers who have to act according to the mandate of heaven. Over the next centuries, the mandate was always a steady companion of any ruler to be. The Sui Tang needed legitimacy and used it to establish a continuous line of heavenly degrees. The Song built large structures to observe the skies and keep track of the rhythms of the world. The new contact with the outside in an extensive trading network meant that now was the time to show that the mandate of heaven not only meant that the ruler of all under heaven does show benevolence to the people one rules, but also that he inspires the barbarians with his own qualities and the quality of the Chinese civilization. At the same time, the Neo-Confucianists such as Chu Xi were working on old scriptures and released them with new commentary, such as the Doctrine of the Mean, which states that that which heaven has conferred is called the nature. In accordance with this nature is called the Tao. The Ming firmly held the belief that the meeting of the five, the planetary meetup, was accountable for the change of, among others, Zhou, Han and Song. The cosmos followed a cyclical path, dynasties rise and fall, and it was the degree of heaven that preceded each event. Classics and religions reinterpreted over centuries and the importance of the rites shifted and changed. Where does it leave us today? Where is the mandate of heaven? The last dynasty fell in 1911 to the great nationalist streams who thought to change the country forever. But it was a Ge Ming, or not? The modern term Ge Ming and its modern western meaning of revolution was surely not decoupled from its ancestral meaning right away. In a sense, the overthrow of the last Qing dynasty represents a tipping point. It was a Ge Ming, but possibly in both senses of the word, a revolution and a removal of a mandate from the failing empire. When Mao Zedong came to power, he decidedly wanted a Marxist, a Maoist revolution. The old Ge Ming was dead. The old values were obsolete and needed to be abandoned. The Ge Ming died with Mao himself. At some point, it was not a Ge Ming anymore at all. It became a Gai Ge, a reform. Just as much as Mao despised the old concepts of Ge Ming, Confucianism took a break as well. But there are today many places in which the old Confucian thoughts seep back into the fabric of Chinese society and politics. One's culture and history are hard to forget and escaping it may be harder than one thinks. In recent years, we have seen the term used in Western media as if it is a concept that is still of great significance in and is somehow socio-politically exclusive to China. To its exclusivity, I am compelled to disagree. The mandate, its rights, its function in the scope of history is nothing unique. The display and expression of power is not only a demonstration of it, but also a legitimation. This is a fact found in most, if not all, nations and former kingdoms and empires. From Kim's North Korea over Genghis Khan's Mongolia, Hitler's Germany and Trump's USA, every power has its rites and ceremonies which serve in principle the same function. Demonstration of the stability of the state, the power of the state over the individual, the importance of the power structure, the legitimacy of the ruler, and assertions of superhuman qualities are all common among all these rites and processes. Not even the word, the mandate of heaven, is exclusively Chinese or exclusively used in the Chinese context. However, I don't think that the realization of the common is the issue. The issue is, as it has been for long, Orientalism. The mystifying of the so-called Orient, essentializing every aspect, painting it as static and unchanging, 
following obscure rules, eating mystical foods and so on. For the same reason why the mandate of heaven appears in so many news articles, the term Silk Road is used in almost every newspaper on the Belt and Road Initiative, because it is essentially the most basic of knowledge which can be orientalized in the Chinese context. Do I believe the mandate is insignificant in China today? No. It is undeniable that China's modernity is connected to its history, age-old institutions and their functionality are hard to ignore, and even I can find people online who draw such connections themselves. Classical scripture is learned by heart in school. The knowledge does not disappear. However, the use inside the realm of media is very often attached to a stereotypical orientalized notion of China. These media outlets would never make a serious comparison to the mythological notions about the old German Kaisers and Angela Merkel. But the mandate of heaven is projected onto the Chinese leadership in all earnest. In my view, it established an image in which we in the West, at least in the public forum, are able to change in a short time span, but China cannot. This cannot be the right way. Nevertheless, the mandate of heaven is historically and culturally a fascinating topic. There is so much more to it that one could easily write several books about it. While modern science has dispelled most of the meaning of the heavenly movements, the people of the olden days would certainly warn us not to be too sure of ourselves. The five ministers might meet again soon, and as it turns out, they do, September 8th, 2040. Even if one doesn't believe, it can't hurt to keep one's eyes set on the skies above. Thank you for watching. Until next time.